Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Legal Weekly Wine, where we discuss the week's hottest legal topics. This week, we have Biden stepping down from the candidacy for president of the United States. That happened this Sunday. Afterwards, shortly afterwards, on the same day, he endorsed Kamala Harris, his current vice president, as the next nominee for the Democratic Party. We've had a lot of fallout from that, both good and bad, from that situation. We want to discuss what's happened a little bit of why it's happened, but what to do next. We want to make sure we focus on the constitutional and political ramifications and procedures, if any, as to what happens in this situation. When did it last happen, if at all, and where do we go from here, especially since we have the Democratic National Convention coming up in a matter of weeks. We also want to talk about um, the Secret Service this week, as we've had the assassination attempt on pres um, former President Trump, we've had a lot of issues coming up with the Secret Service. How, if at all, were they lax in security and setting up for the rally? What should they be doing in the future? And that has led to the um, current director of the Secret Service stepping down from her post um, this week. So that's a lot of what we have going on right now. We hadn't intended to continue taping in these last weeks, but this is too monumental. We had to cover it. So let's get started. I'm Virginia Tarani. I'm with Tarani Law LLC because you never need a lawyer tell you do. I'm also the CEO of The Law Unscripted that hosts this podcast, The Legal Weekly Wine, as well as The Law Unscripted podcast and bar preparation material. So please check that out. I know it's the last minute for bar preparation for the summer of 2024, but there are many other students taking it. If you need a last minute review, we're supplemental class. So the eight core subjects, check it out if you need some extra help with an outline, a lecture, a hypothetical, something like that. And we now have merch. So check out our website for some merch, some funny quotes, some funny lawyerly quotes on there, quotes about law school, quotes about the bar exam. Check it out and purchase today. I am joined by my fellow co-host, who is also an attorney with Tarani Law and a fellow with the Law Unscripted, Chelsea Rogers. Welcome. Hey, glad to be here. Um, there's too much. We could just can't stop taping. Yeah, it's it's real. It's good and it's bad. I, I wish we didn't have so much to tape tape about. It would be, I think, better for everyone. But anyway, yes, glad to have you. And our other co-host, we've got Dr. John Vile. He is a a continuing contributor to the Law Unscripted, as well as the dean of the Honors College at Middle Tennessee State University. He is a constitutional law um, scholar and an expert in political science and the Constitution and the amending process. So we're really thrilled to have you here, especially to tackle more of the political science side of what's happening in our politics today. So welcome. Good to be here. All right, it is the Weekly Wine. We're going to have some happy hour going on. I have brought back, I really enjoyed the Riesling I had last week. So I've brought it back again, a Cold Creek Vineyard um, Chateau Saint-Michel Riesling. That has been really a nice summer edition. So I've brought that back. Chelsea, what are you drinking? I am doing caffeine today. So I have a Celsius. Let's see. This one is Kiwi Guava. Celsius, sponsor nice. me. I'm obsessed. Very nice. And Dr. Violet, looks like you're approving of that choice. Well, you know, I went to Costa... I spent a year as a child in Costa Rica. And I went back three or four years ago to visit... Mm. And rediscover it. I don't know if I'd ever remembered guava, but every time I drink it, I feel like I'm six again. Oh, uh, so <laughs> so I enjoy it. But that's I'm, a nice memory. I'm, later in the day, I'll do some of the Pepsi, but for now, it's water. Okay. Well, cheers, everybody, as we talk about what happens next. All right. So, brief recap: the last couple of weeks, we've been talking on this program about the possibility of President Biden stepping aside for the candidacy for a second term this coming for this coming presidential election in 2024. We've said a lot about it, and on this show, ultimately, we've been of the opinion and expressed the opinion that it would probably be best for President Biden to step aside. And Dr. Vile, I love that you've been adding 
famous quotes. You always have the historical uh, um, context that that we, Chelsea and I just don't have. But you were able to give us another quote um, about George Washington. And I, I'd love for you to recap for us what that quote was and why it has been, why we've used it, excuse me, in the past few weeks regarding Biden, his current presidency, and if he steps aside and why. I'm not sure it's a quotation. I think it's a an analogy, but I could you, you may be referring to something else. But uh, actually, I published an article, posted an article two or three weeks ago on why I thought Biden should step aside and suggesting that instead of just opening up the convention, uh, that he at least say who he favored. And I suggested it probably would be Kamala Harris. Uh, it was published on Sunday. And later that afternoon, he resigned. So I can only conclude post hoc <laughs> ergo propter, propter hoc, as we've talked before. It must have been the cause. But one of the things that I referred to there is, well, two things. One is a reputed conversation between a portrait paint, painter, Benjamin West, and King George III, who, after the king, according to West, asked him what Washington was going to do after the Revolutionary War. He said, well, everybody's expecting him to go back uh, to his farm. And he said, and George III reputedly said, if he does that, he'll be the greatest man in the world. And in fact, Washington did do that, not once, but but twice. twice. Then maybe, maybe others. But at the end of the Revolutionary War, uh, he gathered with Congress ceremoniously handed back the sword that he had had as commander-in-chief and went back to his farm. And then at the end, he actually considered resigning or, or not running for re-election after his first presidential term. He's the only president ever to have been elected unanimously by all of the electors who cast votes. Uh, but at the end of the second term, he stepped aside, and he was, particularly probably because of the first, but with both combined, he was often likened to Cincinnatus, who was a Roman general uh, who was, according to the story, plowing his field when the authorities came and said, we need your help here in repulsing the enemy. He went, uh, had a victory, and then went back to his farm. So, you know, the I think that Biden, now, now there is a question, you know, how long... I think that Biden is showing decline in age uh, and energy. Yeah. How long has this been going on? I don't know. I don't think it's been going on for four years. Um, but even then, I mean, he had the nomination. I think he had it clinched. Um, it certainly would have been a bloody mess if he had gone to the convention and people who were pledged to him reneged on the pledge. Some people would say that that had been unfair. And in fact, Republicans apparently want to go to court uh, saying, yeah, they have no standing, by the way. They and want Chelsea's to go to court face, saying, I, I have to point out Chelsea's face in response to Dr. Vile's comment there is, is quite entertaining. Chelsea, what's your thought on this? Okay, so it's it's no one's going to be surprised. It's less of a thought, more of a question, because this was a conversation I swear I talk about my mom every thing. We work in the same office together, so she's like my coworker. And, you know, she was on her break and she's on her phone and every other video that she is seeing is about this. And I'm like, so, you know, I'm like trying to do my work and like listening. And I was like, play, play that back. What are you listening to? And I was shocked. I don't understand what they're trying to, like, I think I just don't understand it, but I, there was so much about it um, in the past couple of days. And what are, what are they doing? What are they trying to do? I don't think I fully understand. Well, it's completely inconsistent. They don't okay. think Biden should be running. They don't think he was competent. But now that he's, you know, that they would rather, they really wanted to run against Biden. Uh, oh, yeah. And I mean, because. I think, you know, now, it, historically, people get a bump after a convention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, whatever party it is. And we saw that, I think, with, with Trump. Absolutely. Uh, but what we're getting here is, an, I think, an unexpected bump in enthusiasm particularly. Uh, you know, Trump is always saying, you know, Joe Biden is low energy. It's harder to say that about Kamala Harris. Uh, she's younger than he is. And we'll get to this in a moment. But my theory is 
she has an advantage by being younger than Trump, and the, her vice presidential candidate would have an advantage if he were older than Vance. Mm. So we'll see if that uh, see if that and and it'd be hard to get somebody younger because I think I think Vance is only thirty nine years old and you Correct. have to be at least thirty five. Uh, to run for the office. Correct. Now, you were mentioning something about standing. So with Republicans complaining that Biden's stepping aside for this candidacy, there sounds like there might even be talk of civil lawsuits about this. Yeah, uh, but... What would it be based on? It's very unlikely to... And I mean, this is basically an intra-party... Matter. matter. They're saying that Republicans this don't is want anti-democracy. Yeah, Republicans like, <laughs> don't want the courts telling them how they have to nominate people, and the same for the Democrats. The only time that I know that courts have stepped in in matters dealing with, say, primaries or parties have to do with the all-white primaries, hmm. yeah. where the court said, well, you can't practice racial discrimination and you can't just say, well, all, only whites are members of our party, and this is how we've decided to do it. So there's a little bit of precedent there. But this is an internal matter. Uh, it's, you know, it's this up is to— not, They're I not mean, breaking the law. Republicans are complaining, mm-hmm. what, they're going right. to complain that they've been harmed? I guess because because he's stepping down, they now have a stronger candidate. I mean, <laughs> right. yeah, they're saying. I mean, essentially, the videos yeah. on videos and videos, at least that I was seeing, just sort of clips of people talking about this, is that they're making the argument. Which again, I don't. I mean, I don't know how you. This is not like what it, my understanding, and both of y'all will know better than I do that anything that the way a, a convention is run or the way a party is run is not really a legal matter as far as you know the ideas of, of fairness or whatever. And so they're basically just saying this is anti-democracy. They can't do that. Um, yeah. I mean, well, I love, I, I love creative lawyering. I say that, you know, every other episode here, I love it. I love creative lawyering, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't know what the, there. There's, there's no, st- I mean, to have stand, you have to have a real case or controversy. Yeah. They would have to show how they were, how they were harmed. Personally, it can't be just mm-hmm. as a citizen of the U.S. Yeah. No, no. Right. But, I mean, it's like the, I love going to court and, um, for attorneys, especially younger attorneys or those who are, are learning and are mock trial students where they will object to evidence coming in and the judge says, well, well why? And well, that hurts my case. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. Your Honor, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that admission. <laughs> this is really harmful. Let's tell the jury. <laughs> So I, I feel like it's that is, wait, we object because that hurts us. Um, yeah. it, it makes it harder for us to run. Um, yeah. So I, I feel that that's a lot of what's coming out. But let's go back to the fundamentals. Now, in the Constitution, we do not have a party system that's created. Is that correct? That's right. You have some recognition of the emergence of a party system in the 12th Amendment. And what is that one? Prior to the 12th Amendment, each individual elector would cast two votes for president, and whoever got the highest became president, the second highest became vice president. When that resulted, well, two things, resulted in 1896 in the election of a Federalist president and a Democratic-Republican vice president, Adams and Jefferson. And in 1800, you ended up with a tie between the two people on the ticket for the Republican Party, namely Jefferson and Burr. And, and you're so talking, you it wasn't se- 1800s, you it was separate votes. 1700s, right? I'm sorry, what did I say? 1800. So Jefferson 1800s. was 1700s. No, 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 I got it right. The, the election of 1800. Oh, of 1800, in, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, right. The election of 1800 was the one, I believe I got it right, where... Jefferson was select. Jefferson and Burr tied, and Jefferson was after the thirty-sixth vote, I believe it was, or on the thirty-sixth vote, uh, the jam, the dam broke, and uh, he was selected. Served two terms, but there's remember no- it well. Cre- <laughs> right. You remember it from fond, fond personal <laughs> memories, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but. 
But from our beginning, I mean, we've had different political parties. Most of us, we know the Republican and the Democrat Party, but these were not the only parties, and they've come after a long tradition. And even when with Lincoln, Lincoln was voted in one party, but really for the way that we know it was would have been the, the different party in our age. Is that right? Well, he was the first Republican candidate to win the presidency. Uh, there, I believe Fremont had had run in 1856 as a Republican and had not won. Um, you know, you basically, your first two parties are your Federalist parties and your Democratic Republican. Then, then you go to the Democratic Party and the Whig Party, then the Whigs and the Republic, I'm sorry, then the Republicans and the Democrats have been pretty much, you know, with a smattering of third and fourth parties uh, ever since. Mm-hmm. Party, we've had the party Bull Moose Party. have weakened. Right. But Pardon. we've had the, even the Bull Moose Party, that was Teddy well, Roosevelt. That, that was basically progressive Republicans breaking off from TAF Republicans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, as I think we mentioned, that party actually came in second during that election out right. of three candidates. So how are the parties set up? If, we, if they're not based on the Constitution, what governing documents do we have? How do we know how the conventions are run? What are these intra-party rules that everyone thinks that they know and are based on the Constitution but aren't? Well, I mean, the, the First Amendment, ratified in 1791, guarantees the right of peaceable assembly, and that has been a been in turn associated with the right of association. We had the right to join groups. If you read to Tocqueville, 1830s, one of the fascinating things about the United States is the way that people would get together collectively on a whole variety of matters, you know, religious, social, political, uh, and the like. Um, But basically, you know, parties are there to win elections. That's their primary function. And that's what you see, frankly, with what with this change that has been brought about. Biden was selected with the expectation it would be a Biden and Harris ticket when it looked like Biden was faltering physically and in terms of energy. uh, The party says, you know, we don't want to lose. The polls all show us behind. They could still lose. It's still a, a relatively close race. But part of what's happened is, is, and again, it could be temporary. You have this big surge of interest, new face. I'm sure particularly women are probably, you know, this would be, it's, well, I guess the second time you've had a a woman from a major party running for president. Uh, But that brings a lot of excitement. Um, But essentially, parties... Right. They set their own rules. You know, in in early America, presidential candidates were chosen by congressional caucuses. People in Congress of like mind would get together. They nominate a candidate. 1830, I believe, the first convention, the anti-Mason party, uh, they put and usually the choice, you know, each state would party would elect representatives who would meet together and they would decide on a candidate in the progressive era in the 1890s through the early 1920s, there's was a great emphasis on direct democracy. So you had the development of the political party primaries. And since about the late 60s, early 70s, most people are, are chosen basically through political part primaries and caucuses which, however democratic in appearance, often represent the extremes of the party and the party regulars. A lot of people don't vote in a general election. And then if you think of voting in a, you know, for one thing, many people, especially today, are not that, don't identify that strongly with one party or the other. And, you know, one of the things you got to figure out when you go vote depends on the state. Some states, if you're not registered Republican or Democrat, you can't do that. But in a lot of states, you choose that day which primary you're going to be in. Right. And it's a lot of trouble, frankly. I mean, it's it's more trouble probably than a general election. 
Um, and you're but, mentioning caucus. So we know the, the primaries, uh, that's what I'm familiar with is, you know, if right. you're registered for a Republican, you vote, go and vote in the Republican primaries, et cetera. But what is a caucus and how well, do people get involved in that? Well, we, I've actually talked about two different kinds of caucuses. In the early Republic, you had groups like today, you'll have progressive Democrats or you'll have, um, uh, I don't know, Liberty Bell conservatives. I'm making the, t- that the up Tea Party. Tea Party, <laughs> that's right. You have Tea Party conservatives. Right. And if we were back in the early republic, maybe each one of them would front somebody up, they would have an election, and then you get the president. Modern caucuses are basically you have town or county meetings, all Republicans show up, all Democrats show up, you sh- maybe not on the same day. Uh, so let's say the Republicans, okay, you take a vote and you say, how many people here favor Trump? Uh, you all get together in this corner. How many people favor Haley? Are there other candidates? And then you work through and you say, well, we only got four people here who favor, you know, governors, our, our state governor as a president. So there's not enough there to give anybody a vote. Who do you guys want to go with? And then they would decide whether they want to go with Trump or Haley or whoever it is. So, but as opposed to vote, okay, primary voting, I've already talked about that, you know, you got to, you got to tell somebody what party you're a member of, which I frankly don't particularly like doing. Uh, And then, you know, sometimes you have to be strategic. Well, if there's, you know, if you, if you know, it's, if you're a Republican and you know that uh, Donald Trump's going to win, maybe you'd have more influence if you voted to a Democrat and vice, you know, vice versa. Um, But the problem with the caucus is you're often there three or four hours. Hmm. Uh, and particularly if it occurs in Iowa, it might be a night where there's 12 inches of snow on the ground. And, you know, maybe people like me maybe would enjoy it, but maybe you just, maybe you'd be like me and just find you got mad when you went to one of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Get home and not be able to sleep afterward to all your nutty neighbors. <laughs> so, the, the problem with both caucuses and primaries is that they tend to bring out, among Democrats, they tend to bring out people who are more left than the general party. And among Republicans, they tend to be, bring out people who are more right. So whether they are any better representative of, you know, and are they as good at choosing winners? The, 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 the primaries developed out of opposition to the so-called smoke-filled rooms, where you know, a bunch of buddies that get together, smoke cigars, and decide who the presidency would be, president would be. That doesn't seem very democratic. But if those people are governors and uh, members of Congress and important people, they may have a pretty good feel for who can be elected. And again, primary purpose of political parties is to win. Right. Uh, and so that's basically what you saw here, I think, with this transition from Biden to Harris. And the only surprise I've had about it is, is, and and I guess it could even change in the next four weeks, but it, if I understand it, it looks like enough delegates have already pledged to Harris hmm. that she's going to win without having a contested uh, primary. In fact, you know, I'm in Tennessee right now. The Tennessee Democrats were the first group to, to say, we're going to cast all our votes for Harris. Uh, and so what the possibility of a very contentious contest uh, seems to have ended, you know, absent some something coming up. Well, and there are some people who are calling. So we've had the question that I want to make sure we address of open conventions. Mm-hmm. What is an open convention? When is the last time we had one and how would it work? Or are we expecting one this year for the Democratic Party? Well, there are two things that are are, are in the news. One is sort of what's called a brokered convention. And that's a convention where you don't have a winner on the first ballot. Mm. And then then often delegates are released from any pledges that they have made. uh, And there's a lot of negotiation going on. And as far as I can tell, the last broker convention occurred among Democrats in 1952 when... Uh, Estes Kefauver, who was a Tennessean 
and at life Stevenson, who was from Illinois, were running against one another. And ultimately, Stevenson got both that and the and the next one. Then in terms of a open convention, which is one where nobody, well, I guess, yeah, this wasn't done so much in back rooms, but in 1968, you had an unusual, you had a situation similar to what happened this year. Lyndon Johnson, who had served just over one, not quite one and a half terms. He had taken over when Kennedy was assassinated uh, and then won on his own in 1964. He announced not quite as late as Biden, but relatively late that he was not going to seek re renomination. Um, and when that happened, then not long after, so Eugene McCarthy, as I recall, had challenged him in the New Hampshire primary and had a very good showing. Uh, after Johnson withdrew, Bobby Kennedy uh, mm -hmm. threw his hat into the ring. Um, and then the obvious choice to succeed Lyndon Johnson was Hubert Humphrey, who was his vice president. Ultimately, Robert Kennedy had a famous debate with McCarthy uh, uh, in, in which in California, after which Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine, you know, this was somebody who had a had a real chance at being nominated. So you get to the convention, uh, people are still, you know, calling out Bobby Kennedy's name. Mm -hmm. uh, John Humphrey was in something of a weak position because people associated him like, like Johnson with the Vietnam War. And you had a very, very contentious convention. Uh, before Hubert Humphrey was eventually nominated. So what happens in, in this type of convention, with an open convention, after everybody through the primaries has already elected their their delegates, right? They've already said, we are we voted for Biden, right? We expect right. Our, our representatives to go and vote for Biden. Well, now that Biden's gone, how do those representatives represent the will of the people? Since we well, didn't get to vote for Biden, or well, we didn't I get mean, to vote, we voted for Biden, and there's there's somebody yeah, else. Well, they, but most people, I think, did vote. I don't know if Biden and Harris were both listed as candidates, but certainly people expected that if they voted for Biden, that he was going to continue with Harris. So it's not quite as tricky as it might be if the, if there were not a vice president. You know, if you, I mean, in a sense, if you cast your vote for one. You were sort of casting your vote for the other. But were we think, really voting for Kamala as vice president? Because I'll, I'll say, um, as a personal injury attorney, Morgan & Morgan is the biggest law firm on the East Coast for personal injury. I mean, they are crushing it. Um, they're extremely well known. And Morgan came out yesterday and says... I cast my vote for Biden. He's no longer on the ticket. He withdrew like one million dollars or something, some a very large number of support from the campaign. So how do we say something? You know, he's like, okay, well, Harris was on the, you know, Kamala was on the ticket for VP. I didn't want her as president. Well, you shouldn't be. I mean, you shouldn't have somebody for vice president who you don't think is capable of being president. I mean, that applies to any candidate. But Morgan and Mor Morgan may have withdrawn a million of his dollars. I, I can't affirm. I mean, I haven't seen that story. But apparently, hundred me, you know, yeah. at one point two million other people contributed something like a hundred million dollars in the forty-eight hours or so after Kamala uh, declared that she was all in. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, there seems to have been, and part of it is just think about it. She had. She had she has been her campaign has been fully integrated with that of Biden's. And imagine trying to put together a national campaign mm. on your own at this late stage. So in a sense, Biden really did do her. I, I think it was more a matter of him having to wait, you know, to change his mind. Well, he's right. going to give a speech. So we'll, we'll find out maybe a little bit more. But the longer he waited the greater difficulty anybody would have had to challenge the obvious person, which would have been Kamala. So. Do we have any calls? Um, Chelsea, maybe you're seeing this, especially with your 
your entanglement with social media in a positive way, um, you're much more adept at that and, and seeing it much more often. What are other people saying with regard to other possible candidates? Are they trying to push other candidates? Are they throwing their support behind Harris? Where are we, we headed that way? Yeah. So from everything I've seen um, is a full support. And of course, you know, my algorithms or my for you pages or my friends or what I'm seeing, but um, everyone is very, well, I think first I have to preface it. Everybody I was personally seeing wanted Biden to step down. I had nobody in my social media or things that I was seeing that wanted him to stay the candidate. So unsurprisingly, um, they're all pretty happy. I mean, if there had, but I do think it's interesting. If there had been a full primary, I don't think most of those people would have voted for Kamala. But at this point, I don't think there was another option, um, being that Biden dropped out so late and the, all of the money to run a national campaign. Right. Um, so I think at least what I'm seeing, most people are like, well, if I'd had other choices, I might not have chosen her, but it's good enough. Yeah. And, and I'm of the mindset of, well, okay, yeah, people voted for Biden, but there was nobody else on the ticket, essentially. Right. is He was the incumbent. Well, Phillips, yeah, he, but... He got nowhere. Exactly. Yeah. Was there really? Yeah. There was no real yeah. challenge to him because right. he was the presumptive incumbent who was saying he was going to run again. So in my mind, it shouldn't make that much of a difference because, well... Mm -hmm. I didn't get to vote for some, you know, if we'd had a full party contest, yeah. well, I don't know that I would have voted for Biden if there had been another option, if I had been a Democrat, you know, he was yeah. essentially the ticket holder. So now that he's gone, it, you know, yes, it would be nice to go back to the primaries and to be, be nice to put other people on the ticket, but we don't have time for that. I think, yeah, I think that's like the overwhelming sentiment that I'm saying is just like at this point that move, him dropping out and her taking his place, essentially, really is the only feasible move because the election is so close. Um, I do think it's funny that, at least in what we've seen so far, is that Kamala, um, by sort of the, the conservatives, is being called far left, um, like, far, like a far left extremist, which is funny because anybody that I know who might be considered further to the left, I think she's way too moderate. I um, think she's way, way, way too moderate. And so I've just been personally enjoying that back and forth um, and sort of marketing of how, how they're approaching it. Yeah, it's been could interesting have changed to right. see that. Go ahead, Dr. Vile. Well, what could have changed things is nobody stepped up after Biden stepped down and said, I want it. Uh, and of course, one reason is that many of them would be would prefer being vice president to whatever position mm. they're in now. And so you want to come out strongly supporting the new presidential nominee, maybe in hopes that the, that you will be chosen, if not for vice president, maybe for the cabinet. So yeah. let's um, talk about the vice president. Does Kamala just get to pick a vice president? Yes. Does that well, go to open convention? How does that happen? You, you could have she she has two options. She could say, and if you want to add a little bit of spice to the convention, you could say, um, because you know because of the way this has turned out, we really haven't had as much choice as we would like. Let's open to the convention, and you tell me who I should pick, and I'll go with it. Mm. Uh, that's been done before. Um, but I think it's more likely that she will do what Biden... What, right. So the convention is not obligated. They still have to take a vote. Well, first they have to take a vote in early August as to who their candidate is going to be. And looks like, you know, 99% chance that it's going to be Kamala Harris. Uh, my guess is that she will wait till the first day of the convention or thereabouts to announce her vice presidential candidate. Which is what Trump uh, did. Right, right. I mean, you, th the problem with conventions right now is conventions used to mean something. Mm -hmm. You did not know when you went to the convention for sure who was going, who was going to be the nominee. Now you almost always do. Mm -hmm. So you look for elements of surprise, uh, and then you hope to get Kid Rock and who was the other star? Hulk Hogan. Yeah, Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan. That's right. You hope to get some celebrities there to 
keep it interesting. Look, I, they just I need to get Taylor Swift there. They just need to get Taylor <laughs> Swift there. Agreed. And- Bring out the young voters. By I mean, seriously, if you're looking for young voters, you're going to put Taylor Swift. If you're looking for others, I mean, George Clooney was one of the people who called for Biden to step mm-hmm. down. He's extremely well regarded in most of the public. And if he were to show up at the convention, that would have a pretty big sway, I think. So, yeah. Now, I want to talk a minute about civility. Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Um, and I, I, I honestly believe, I believe that if a Democrat or any other person had said this, that I would be equally offended. So yeah, I'm not, but so. I'm going to just focus on the principle that you don't kick somebody when they're down, right? Is that, I mean, I, that's not in the constitution. Right. It's, but, it's not an amendment. But, you it know, something be. that I hope I've taught my daughters and that my parents taught me, you be gracious. Uh, I can still remember 1964, my candidate for president lost. Lyndon Johnson was, was elected president over Barry Goldwater and I was just heartbroken. And before I went to school, my parents sat me down and said, we know you're upset by this, but if somebody asks you what happened, just say, I guess we got outvoted. Mm. Uh, You don't say, you know, I don't know how that crooked Lyndon Johnson got real, you know, got renominated. So what does Trump say? Now, Now, think about this has got to be a traumatic decision, whether you like Trump, Biden or not. Right. It would be traumatic for me. If all my colleagues started dropping hints, uh-huh. maybe they already have and I haven't heard them. <laughs> you but, didn't you know, get the letters? Dropping hints that maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe I'm a little long in the tooth to be Dean. Uh, I seem to be wandering off lately. I can't keep it. You can't give a sentence. That would be very traumatic for me to have to say, okay, I guess it's time to step aside. So Especially here you have a man, playing out on national television right, and across the country. Here you have a country. man who's been in public life for 40 exactly. years. I don't agree with a lot, you know, a lot of things that Biden did, but he's given service to his country. Mm-hmm. So what do you say if you're his opponent and he drops out? You say crooked Joe Biden was not fit to run for president, is not fit to serve, and never was. Uh, he only attained the position of president by lies, fake news, and not leaving his basement. All those around him, including the doctor and the media, knew that he wasn't capable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They are the words of someone who is running for president of the United States. Who's been who president of the United when States. They're down. Right. And I, I just, no matter who, anybody who was that ungracious does not deserve, in my judgment, to be a dog catcher, but it's it's very negative. It, and and as you and I it, were it's discussing, just, it's offline. just unnecessary. Mm-hmm. And and it yeah. pro- you know maybe maybe it stirs up your base, but there got to be some God fearing people out there who say we don't want somebody who is this unkind. Well, and he does a lot of name calling. I mean, how many, how long that he's been running since he's been running and involved in politics? It's a lot of name calling, a lot like a children's playground of, you know, this Mr. So-and-so and and this person. And I feel like it's, I don't appreciate those comments about Biden. Um, I, I dislike them and am repulsed more for the comments about Kamala Harris that are coming out. Well, a lot of them are seen to be race-based and gender-based. Gender and race-based, a lot of suggestion that she's sleeping her way to the top that I don't think you would. I I mean, if we want to talk about sleeping our way to the top, let's talk about President Clinton, who was a male. But how dare we say anything about a male, but once it's a female, it seems to be the let's play the race in the sex card. And the only reason, you know, clearly the only reason a woman can be in power is she slept her way to the top. Well, and that's I, ridiculous. It, it really repulses me as a woman. Um, it's, it's gross. Like, it is yeah. so gross. Actually, my undergrad to like a million and a half years ago research project, the research I did in undergrad and presented um, in Georgia was about gendered language in the media. So this was 2015, 16-ish. So Lots of interesting conversations because Hillary was running right. at this point. Um, so I feel like we all knew this was coming. We all knew the race comments were coming. We all knew the gender comments were coming. But I think all I can say about it is 
you only have to attack the person when your ideas don't win. So if you had better ideas, you had a better argument, you wouldn't have to make these like ad hominem attacks. You wouldn't have to do it. Um, And I think that it's really disappointing to see people who want to lead the country think that doing that is leadership. Like it's embarrassing. Speaker Johnson, who I think has not been particularly well, whose judgment I question in other matters has apparently sort of spoken to people in his party and said, this is not, you know, let, let's let's take the high road here uh, rather than the low road. Right, which I appreciate. And, and I'm thrilled to have a woman candidate. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll, you know, I'll put out a personal, more personal than I, I would care to share normally, but I will put it out there, especially for people who are like me, who are struggling with these decisions and, and the gender politics and the race politics and LGBTQ, LGBTQ politics. I mean, it's out there. And in 2016, as a female, I would have loved to see Hillary Clinton win, but I did not vote for her. I actually voted for Trump. Now, now I, I can't, my politics have changed, (laughs) but, and and I'm admitting it. And, and, you know, there, I, I don't think I'm alone is I believed at the time that as much as I wanted a woman to win, I didn't want that one to win. And I had I had a whole host of reasons, and I feel like they were, you know, very well thought out, very well considered. Knowing more now, I cannot make that same vote. And I don't want, I am not someone who will vote for someone as a woman just because they're a woman. Right. But yeah. in this time, I'm thrilled that we have another option who's a woman. Thrilled. Just and who's as happy qualified? As I was. Who has former prosecutor? Former yes. prosecutor, right up my alley. <laughs> it yes. is qualified. I think that's the other thing that I think I've really been disappointed to see. You cannot like someone's ideas and disagree with them passionately. But may like I, I hate to see the comments that somehow she's not qualified right. to be running. Um, I think that is a silly criticism and is just intellectually dishonest. Like that's not true. Um, I mean, you can disagree with her. I disagree with her mm-hmm. a lot about a lot of things. Absolutely. Um, Me too. Mm-hmm. But I think, I mean, I hate that this is where politics is, right? Like I hate that the conversation is, well, I would vote for her because I'm not voting for him. Um, I think is what a lot of it comes down to. I really wish we, we you know, had a political landscape that was a competition of ideas and not just like I and so disgusted by the other candidate, I guess you get my vote. You know, I hate that this is this is where we're at. Right. And it, it's somewhat similar to me of the the election in two, I guess, 2000, which was Bush Gore. Was that 2000? Yes, 2000. Where it was a, a lot of my friends, it was my first presidential election that I could vote in. And a lot of my friends were like, well, I like, you know, I like this person the least. It, it was, you know, which one do we don't like either candidate, but at least, you know, we'll pick the one that that we're happier with, not that we're thrilled with the candidate. And I feel like we're kind of back there. But in speaking of the comments and what's been coming out since the, the new developments, I will say I, I have been most concerned and disgusted is another word for it, but but most concerned as well with what's coming out of the Republican Party, especially when we're getting, we've just had the assassination attempt. I mean, we're within two weeks of the assassination attempt on former President Trump when at the time that we're taping this. And there has been a long call from a lot of people, including President Biden, of we need to talk about unity. We need to work toward unification and not you know, diversion, goodness, now I can't think, um, divisiveness, right? We, we need to come together. And shortly after this, what we're coming up with is, is a very shocking conversation in front of a large crowd at a fundraiser in Ohio, where George Lang, a state senator, steps up to introduce, you know, his candidate, J.D. Vance, for vice president, since Vance is from Ohio. And what he ends up saying is, quote, I'm afraid if we lose this one, it's going to take a civil war to save the country, and it will be saved. It's the greatest experiment in the history of mankind, and if we come down to a civil war, I'm glad we got people like Bikers for Trump on our side. And 
fight, 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 fight. It's very divisive and it's very strongly worded where we're inciting violence in my mind, especially after an assassination attempt. You have a revolution when you have all paths blocked to representation. 1776, you had a parliament in which we were not represented, attempting to tell us, attempting to tax us and tell us what we can trade and what we can, et cetera, et cetera. The, one of the most important revolutions in America was the revolution of 1801, when after basically 12 years of Federalist rule, the people said, you're pushing too far in a monarchical direction, too far in the commerce mercantile direction. We need somebody who takes, you know, takes more account of the common man. And they elected Mr. Jefferson. Uh, 1828, you had something similar. Uh, we're going to elect Andrew Jackson over John Quincy Adams, who tended to sort of stand for same, some of the same or was associated with some of the same kind of things. We, we don't need to resort to violence when we have free and open elections. Uh, and frankly, any legislator who starts talking like that, you know, his constituents ought to throw him out on his ear. That's not how we do things here. Right. And it's, but it's very similar to the the leader of Project 2025, who was saying recently a couple of weeks ago about, you know, a, a new American revolution has to occur. Um, well, I, yeah, go ahead. And again, you, you can, sometimes people, when they say that, they're, they're speaking metaphorically. There is a place for that to say we need a, <clears throat> Although often revolution is is phrased in terms of a return to first principles, uh, you know we want revolutionary change. We need to go back to the founding fathers, or we need to go back to this or that. There's nothing wrong with with talking, you know. Is but go to a, back to our there's a difference roots. between a revolution and ideas and parties and a civil war. Right. And, you know, I believe this yeah. is right. I believe we lost more people in the Civil War than we have in all of any other war we've ever been in, including World War II. Uh, we want to fight. Do we want brother to be fighting against brother? Uh, I don't think so. Um, and who would be on what side? I mean, that's yeah. it, it, I haven't quite figured this out either. You know, you, you, you can sort of understand in the Civil War, you had northern and southern state. You had slave and non-slave right. states, basically. That was a division. I don't, you, you know, we're going to, is it going to be the east coast, east and west coast against the middle? Uh, I hope not. Right. I also think about, oh, sorry, Virginia. No, please go ahead. No, I was going to say that, like, there's the quote, and I have no idea who said it, but it's the idea that, like, violence is the language of the unheard, right? And I was like, well, I'm hearing an awful lot about it. So I think that a call for violence, like, you are not being unheard. Your your voice, your vote are not being suppressed. Um, so I think that it's really frustrating to see that. Like, I, can't your ideas win? Do we really have to call for for a fight? Like, that's crazy to me. And, and I think... In a way, aren't we actually exercising democracy and showing how well our, our experiment has worked in the fact that we have the First Amendment freedom to express the different ideas? Yeah. I'm not, you know, I want to hear from all sides. I may not like everybody's opinions, but I absolutely support their their right to say it. We are They're still right to be allowing. Idiots, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I feel the same if, way. <laughs> if they want to have a different stupid opinion, then they can do it. But you know, if, if they, they want to think the earth right, is flat or whatever, <laughs> knock yourself out. What? It's <laughs> not. <laughs> okay. This is gonna be the headline from this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, the earth Podcast. is flat. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I I'll mean, bring I my still, aluminum, you know, tinfoil hat next time. Oh, so funny. Yeah, I still support, you know, ultimately as an attorney, as a political scientist, I, I fully support this democratic republic that we're in. I support the right to vote. I'm thrilled that we have the freedom of speech. And right now we're not collecting people and jailing them or quieting them if they speak out. And I think that leads us very well into a new book that Dr. Vile is reading. 
Well, I've read it. It's a great book, by the way. Jonathan Turley, uh, who sort of a superstar, George Washington University. I don't, did, I'm assuming you didn't have a class with him. I, but he, I don't think I did. I did go to George Washington for my LLM, but I don't think I had a class with him. Well, he has, uh, he's been before, testified before Congress 50 some times, uh, gone before the Supreme Gone before the courts many times, written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera. And he's something of a contrarian. Uh, there's a lot in this book, a lot of his political opinions that I think, for example, that he gives he gives too much of a pass to Donald Trump on a lot of things. Uh, but he's written this book called The Indispensable Right, Free Speech in an Age of Rage. Um, and that's a great you title. Age of Rage, it turns out. It's not just now. We've had rage throughout our history. We had the Whiskey Rebellion. We had Fry's Rebellion. We had the Civil War. We had mm. suppression of freedom of speech in World War I and II. And what I like about him, one thing I like about him is he loves James Madison. And I like Oh, him, of course. Of course. But he makes a very fascinating argument. And he says that he thinks that even Oliver Wendell Holmes and others have t have led us astray. Hmm. That when we talk about freedom of speech, particularly and other rights, we tend to think of them as rights that are balanced against something else. It's the right to speak against national security or against the need to preserve morals or this or that. And he says, and he's not quite right. He says James Madison ended the right of freedom of speech with a period, not a comma. Well, there's not a period after the right of free speech, but there's a period after a list of rights mm -hmm. with no qualifications. And this is something I don't know if people are going to be able to see this, but I've got to show it because I've ne I did not know. Can you see? Uh, uh, a little bit. There we go. I've got a painting of some flowers. OK, no, no, it's it's a wonderful painting. Then so whole, Norman Rockwell. Oh, OK. Long underestimated, right, by by artists because he wasn't avant-garde. Mm. He did realism, and sometimes they were a little sappy, right? Uh, they often sort of pluck a heartstring, and people say, any artist can do that. So this painting, it's called The Connoisseur, and it has this very well-dressed gentleman in a jacket, looking at a Jackson Pollock work. Jackson Pollock is the one who would drip paint over things and, you know, nobody understood what it was. So here's this guy quietly trying to understand the painting. And Turley says, most professors in law schools are like Jackson Pollock. They want a constitution that's abstract. They want to be able to say, well, what is speech? And speech, this, but, 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 but. And he he's portrays himself as a Norman Rockwell who takes the words to mean exactly what they say. Hmm. And in that respect, his other hero uh, is Hugo Black, uh, who basically Supreme said Court this. Supreme Court Justice. You know, Baptist Sunday school teacher, somebody I can identify with, said, when Congress shall make no law, I took it to mean Congress shall make no law. It's like thou shall not murder, thou shall not steal, et cetera, et cetera. And it is, it, it's, so he, ba he basically says that the First Amendment is a natural right. Mm. It is a God-given right, which is essential to human flourishing uh, and is valuable in and of itself. And he makes a wonderful case for it, uh, beautiful writing, and goes through pretty much all of American history. Uh, and if I may say it, I found a little mistake in his book. Oh, no! And, no, and I'm not going to tell you <laughs> what it is. Man. <laughs> no, no, but so, but I emailed him and said, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but, you know, I've written a lot. I like people pointing it out. And he said he he immediately almost responded back, thanked me for it, said that he, they had actually caught it in the paperback edition, but not in the hardback edition. 
Oh. But I thought that was a good sign that he he respected my speech enough to refer back to it. So Okay, so I have to tell anyway. a story on you. Um, for those who don't know, Dr. Vile is my father. And um, as as many of you listening, clearly he has an extreme and amazing memory for all of these facts and the history, especially when it relates to former presidents, the political system, Supreme Court, Supreme Court justices. And um, it was it was very difficult growing up with you. Um, in many ways, it was wonderful. You're going to talk about John Marshall, I aren't am. you? I am. I knew it. We always went, so Chelsea, we always went to, um, our, our vacations were to president's homes, um, national monuments, national I rocks, especially. Rocks, yeah. Yeah. We, we hit quite a few rocks, Plymouth rock. We, um, hit the natural bridge, Mount Rushmore. We, you know, these were exciting times as a child, right? Other people were going to the beach and, um, <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorites is I was, we were going to law school. We were going, I was going to William and Mary and we took a last trip as a family with my boyfriend at the time. And, um, we ended up going to William and Mary and then on the way back, stopping at John Marshall's house, who was the Supreme court justice in Richmond, in Richmond. And God bless the poor, poor tour guide. Um, because he said something wrong at the very beginning of the tour. And the only person who ever would have caught it, of course, was Dr. Vile, dad. And um, he had to point it out, had to. So this tour that was supposed to be probably about 40 minutes at most ended up being two hours. Because I think you're exaggerating a bit. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> you I just think you are. Call because the man kept you have to walk off the minute, the minute, because you know everything and you say it so eloquently. The minute that happened, I'd be like, actually, I think today's my last day as a tour guide. I'm out. <laughs> Yeah, and his his response was to say every fact he ever knew, learned, remembered about John Marshall to then prove to dad that he did know what he was talking about and could be a good tour guide. So, oh my goodness, the snail's pace of this guy. You don't remember the same thing at John Adams' this house? I, I don't remember. I, I well, mean, it was glazed the, the guide over. The claimed that. She, she misdiagnosed the way that John Quincy Adams had died, and so I. Had, but but she was very good. She went and looked it up and told me I was right. Anyway, so just don't go on a tour um, with Doctor Vile, especially <laughs> for something that he knows quite a bit about. Um, you'll you'll have a longer time, and and I just remember my boyfriend walking off on several occasions um, <laughs> with some great eye rolls. Well, uh, the the best part was when we got to the, to. To Marshall's library. Yes. We and had he to said, knock. would any of you like to read from something that John Marshall wrote? And I, of course, of course, ran with it. Of course I had of to read. Of course, that. Dr. Vile will. So there he was But he reading. still tells that story. Whoever that tour guide was, the, he also has a story. If he's out there, can we, can we get your perspective, please? <laughs> oh, I love it. Yes, it was in 2002. Um, so if anyone remembers that tour, um, please let us know. Because... We apologize to all of you, right? <laughs> well, the other one, it was when we were going into the library, it, it was one of the, the funniest pieces. And I just thought, this is ridiculous because the man said, oh, we're at the library. Maybe he's inside. Let's find out. And, and yeah. so he knocks, was like, Mr. I think Marshall, I hear... yes, yes. <laughs> Mr. Marshall, may we come in? And I think ah, that was the no. second time that, that my boyfriend walked away. <laughs> um, and it was, yeah, it was quite an experience. So the John Marshall house, um, I don't know if I recommend that people go, but it was quite quite an interesting experience for us. <laughs> yeah, so um, I it's really better than the Poe House. Oh my goodness, we did okay. So we thought, well, we'll choose our own. My sister was there, who was extremely into English literature. Um, we loved Poe, and we said, okay, we're going to let you go do something historical and and presidential. We're going to go learn about Poe, and we go over to this house that. The entire tour was, well, this is a chair that was similar to one that Mr. Poe would have used. This is the house that he may have visited. This is a painting that 
would have been at the same time period. And this is the way that this might have been this and would have been this and could have been that. And we're like, do you have anything authentic of Poe's in this house? So that was a huge letdown. And so I went to, we went to St. John's Church. You did. And guess what we found there? You found a full grave, right? I found the grave of Poe's mother, who was an actress. And she was on the outside of the cemetery because it wasn't considered really appropriate to put her in there with all the other God-fearing people. So he found uh-huh. that something real with like Poe. More yes. authentic. <laughs> Much more authentic so about Poe than we, we did. We're going to talk about potential vice presidents? Yes, six? let's do that and round it up. So we ha- my thought, um, I think Trump's vice president pick was ingenious in a lot of ways. And one of the reasons I do, um, you all know some of our opinions from last week regarding those picks, but he chose someone from a swing state. So he chose someone that he hopes if they're, you know, it's a swing state, let's move it Republican because it's their candidate. J.D. Vance is from Ohio. People are going to want to vote for him. So in my mind, Kamala could do herself the same service and choose someone from a swing state. But Dr. Vile, what do you have for us as to who you think it may be? If I had to guess right at the moment, I would say it's going to be either Roy Cooper of North Carolina um, former prosecutor, by the way, he's an outgoing governor, served two terms. So you don't ha- you wouldn't have to worry about taking somebody out of a seat that might be filled by somebody from the other party. Uh, apparently has known Harris for 20 or 30 years. Uh, the other name I think that comes out pretty high is Mark Kelly, Senator from Arizona, husband of, uh, Gabby Gifford. Mm-hmm. Um, Arizona is definitely a swing state. Uh, other possibilities are Andy Bashir of Kentucky. Kentucky, uh, right. You have a Democratic governor in a largely Republican state. Josh Shapiro would be very appealing in that Pennsylvania is one of those almost must-have states. Mm-hmm. Very close. Uh, seems to be, a, you know, uh, he, he really... Uh, did a great job against a Republican candidate, far right Republican candidate. Um, fact that he's Jewish, I don't know if that you know is an issue any longer or not. There's been one other Jewish person who's run for vice president. Uh, and who was Joe that? Lieberman, Joe, Joe Lieberman, who ran with Al Gore. Um, and then there's the Governor uh, Pritzker of of Illinois. Um, I think that's. Pete Buttigieg is mm-hmm. is sometimes Secretary of Transportation is sometimes mentioned. Governor Westmore of uh, Maryland, uh, very popular. Uh, you'd have two African Americans on the ticket. Um, so I, let, I let's think that, pause there. Is Kamala yeah. actually African American? Because I don't believe she well, is. I think she's African American and 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 Indian. Indian, uh, right? Being from India, I, I believe that's her. I believe that that's her her parentage. She's certainly a woman of color, right? Um, now, the there's been a lot of hate regarding the possibility of Kamala with Budajak. Um, A lot of hate with that. A lot of <clears throat> yeah. It, it's yeah. I mean, it, it's very unfortunate. You know, one of our own state representative or. Yeah, representatives from Tennessee, you know, calls her a D, calls Harris a DEI choice. I, that's really demeaning. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's just, you know, not you true. think of all the people who have been chosen to the Supreme Court on the basis of what state they were from. Uh, you know, it's, I, I don't know. I, I mean, they can just put her political resume next to Trump's. And if, like, she has, the appropriate qualifications, whether you like or not, is beside the point. When you look at right. people who have been VP, what their political um, and public service background is, like I think it is a lazy argument to make. Now you can disagree with their ideas, but I think it's lazy to say that um, her being in this position is 
unrelated to her qualifications. Right. And she does have the political context and she's a former lawmaker. And, And if there's an executive who is someone who enforces the law, right, that's the president. That is the executive position. She's been a prosecutor. And whatever mm-hmm. you think of, of who she prosecuted and when and what the crimes were for, there's policies within an office where you were given a job to do, you prosecute, but ultimately it's a judge or a jury who decides. Right. So to yeah. me, having that experience in the law in addition to politics, gives her a bit more credibility in the political atmosphere. Well, one of the things that I've argued, you know, Trump sort of dug himself into a hole when he made the issue between he and Biden one of age. Mm. Yeah, because now— There's only like three years difference between the two. He's so close. And Mm -hmm. and now—and, of course, will be even older than Biden is now at the end of his term if he were elected. Right. But now he's running against somebody much younger. Uh, yeah. I think, and I think all of these candidates would qualify, just as I think it's an advantage for her to be younger than Biden, I'm sorry, than Trump. Both, really. I think it would be good to have someone older than J.D. Vance. Agreed. Sort of portray him as inexperienced, which he largely is in politics. I mean, he's been a, he's been a senator for only two years, and that's his first He's kind of like Obama. Election. Right. Is when Obama was running, they're like, well, who is this upstart who's yeah, only no, had a couple right. of I mean, years in the Senate? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but it'll you know, and again, there is a chance that she would just open it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and I, I, I left out uh, my apologies. I left out the uh, uh, Gretchen uh, Whitmer from uh, Michigan, mm-hmm. who would be highly qualified. She has indicated that she doesn't want that position. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe she's jockeying for Secretary of State. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of disadvantages to being vice president. Mm-hmm. And probably nobody demonstrated them more than Mike Pence. Right. Uh, he basically had to be a yes man. And I mean, and, and part of that's built into the position, right? You have a unitary executive at the very least, if you don't agree with what the president is saying, you keep quiet about it as vice president. Right. Uh, I think he sort of lent, leaned over backwards to to always support Trump uh, until he didn't. And, and that was because he found a higher calling, I think, which was protecting the Constitution of the United States. Uh, so, you know, but you are second fiddle. Uh, right. You know, Hubert Hunt, we, we, we mentioned 1968, mm-hmm. you know, that was an utter disaster for, for Democrats. There were, you know, rioting in the streets, uh, police violence against demonstrators. Uh, poor Humphrey was sort of stuck with Johnson's policies on Vietnam, whether whether he agreed with them or not. And, and that's what's and, happening to Harris is right now she's being lumped into, well, she supports everything that Biden did or, suppo- right. you know, is supposed to do is this is she's just picking up the mantle. She has no thoughts of her own. The right. claim that she's been hiding things. I don't know if she has. I, I mean, we're, we're making a lot of assumptions. And I, as, right. as a lawyer, I hate making assumptions. I like to see the evidence behind it. I'm not saying there isn't. Maybe there is evidence. I'd like to see what's there rather than jumping to a conclusion as to what she knew or didn't know. I, I mean, I, I don't think this is something that, that Biden's been, you know, bantering about with all of his friends or, or his colleagues of, hey, I'm having a difficult time. And so now we've got, and I hate to even bring up another topic at the end, but maybe we'll do this as a teaser for the next one. Um, We haven't yet, at the time that we're taping, we have not yet heard Biden's speech, but at the time that you're viewing this or listening to it, Biden's speech would have gone forward. So we will catch that in the next episode, as well as the question of what's going to happen with these requests for Biden to step down, not just from the candidacy, but now as president, with them claiming no. that he's no longer competent, even as president. Right. And so. another speech, which we do not have time, we will not be able to discuss today because it hasn't happened, but Netanyahu is stressing yes. Congress. And my understanding is, is, this is sort of interesting, neither Harris nor Vance is going to be in attendance. Interesting. Um, 
And you would think really that Vance might, you know, that at least one of them would want to be there to say, you know, to sort of say the other one hasn't been. But, you know, obviously there, there is work to be done in campaigning for both of them. So I'm not, not necessarily blaming either of them for not being there, but it adds a, adds an interesting dimension. It definitely does. Okay, everybody, well, stay tuned with us. We are are trying to cover the hottest legal topics, which right now are very political in nature. Um, So forgive us on that. But we're trying to make sure that that everybody, including we, understand more of what's constitutionally based, what's contractually based, what's party and association and assembly based, and what are the rules and, and the terms that we're playing by right now. And a lot of it is very unclear. And a lot of people, especially in this day, don't know what they are. So hopefully we've given you a little more insight on the rules and regulations and what we don't know and don't have and is kind of up in the air. So we will keep you informed as we know. Um, I'm Virginia Tarani. I am joined by Chelsea Rogers and Dr. John Vile. We are with the Legal Weekly Wine um, that is hosted by The Law Unscripted. Don't forget to like and subscribe our channel so that you can follow us every week as we present the hottest legal topics. Thank you for those who like, subscribe, and comment. We love your support. Um, We try to return the messages at this point, and we look forward to seeing you next time on The Legal Weekly Wine.